Wow, wow, wow. Whoa, what? you did something. While we're waiting, uh, these, are, these are pictures of orca that have been spotted around Bainbridge Island in the last two or three days. And so they're here. Uh, we have uh, the southern residents passed through yesterday and they're down in the Vashon area now. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, that, these are southern residents. The uh, big transients were in, uh, under the Agate Pass Bridge this morning. So if any of you live around there, I don't know if you saw them or not, but uh, they, yesterday they were in there and they got at least one seal. I chose not to show those pictures, they're kind of gory, but. Uh, so any, any of you that have uh, Facebook, there are, there are several groups in Puget Sound that uh, report these as they see them. And it's a good way for us, as we'll explain in our talk, to uh, anticipate where they're gonna be so we don't have to make any noise and disrupt them when we're doing our, our research. There's also a, uh, there's also a, a humpback whale in, in town right now. Uh, it was off of, uh, it was in, not, off of uh, Vashon, but uh, this morning I heard it was up, it was up uh, north a little bit, so he's moving around, it's a he. Off the internet. The, the Orca Watch Network posts these, and and the the people that are experts, I, which I am not, uh, there are a number of people that can tell you individual names and by by the coloration of the animal. We're starting to work, as you'll hear in the talk about, uh, work with their sounds because each of them have a unique voice print. They have they have social calls that that we're, that uh, we're starting to be able to sort out. You know that's unique to this animal, not unique to this animal. You'll, I've got some. We'll, you'll hear it during the talk. I'll repeat again, these are, these are pictures taken off of uh, Facebook from the Orca Sound Network folks that within the last couple of days took these in and around Bainbridge Island. So there are two groups, one of them is, uh, that's, those are big transients, they eat seals. And uh, the other group is uh, Southern Residents are in again here, or at least a part of them, J-Pod. We're, are we going to start right at noon or earlier or what? Okay.
For those of you who just came in, uh, the, the pictures that we're showing came from the internet. Some of you have already heard this, but uh, I pulled these down off of Facebook uh, from the Orca network that's active in Puget Sound. All of these pictures were taken in the last several days around Bainbridge Island. And so we've got the uh, transient, what they call the big, Biggs transient orca population in here. They eat seals and anything they can eat. And then we have a, uh, one of these shows, uh, J-Pod is back in town, the, the southern residents that are threatened, uh, oh, there's like 76 of them left. And they eat salmon. Although somebody told me the other day they thought maybe they had expanded their diet a little bit. I don't know if that's true. But the first, the, one of these pictures, the one with the whales spy hopping, that was under the Agate Pass Bridge this morning. So if you're close to the Agate Pass Bridge, take a look. We, uh, we uh, have dubbed our little project here Wet Sound. Um, it probably isn't appropriate, but that's what we're calling it. So we, we have a file that says that, and we stuff everything in it on our computers. So I'm going to go through this slideshow. Um, and we've got a few pictures and a few things to talk about if I figure out how to do this. OK. What we think we don't know about sound and water. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I used to refer to these kind of things as unkunks, unknown unknowns. And the more Jim and I get involved with the analysis of the underwater soundscape, uh, particularly how uh, with, with marine mammals in it, the more we realize we're just scratching the surface. And I, we hope to show you some of these things that we're doing today. So I started uh, in the Amazon actually doing the uh, recording marine mammals back in 2007. Uh, my wife uh, is a marine biologist and uh, also did a lot of outreach program for education and medical outreach in the Amazon. And I was the bag carrier, but I kept seeing these dolphins in the river called pink river dolphins or for the scientist here, Anea geoferensis. And I had done work with marine mammals over the years and, and uh, said, well, you know, we can voice print these guys and count them because I discovered by looking on the internet that nobody knew how, how many of them there were. And at least in Brazil, there are con considered to be either a dan endangered or at least um, a threatened species because they're taken for bait and stuff down there. So that's how I got started. I, uh, we live in, have lived on a farm uh, since 1977 between Silverdale and Polsbo. Uh, we did look at a house over here, but back in the days we came in 1977, we couldn't afford one. But I wish we'd have bought it then because it was <laughs> uh, retired from the Navy, it was majored in chemistry, uh, did work in nuclear physics, and uh, did a lot of work in and after the US uh, Navy my career there in underwater acoustics. Um, so anyway, I, I thought this would be an appropriate uh, 
introduction. Uh, as most of you know, 70% of the Earth is, is underwater. And uh, what's going on in my mind is that over the last decade, the technologies that have become affordable and available to anybody, whether you're a, a scientist or a citizen scientist or just a hobbyist, are, it's amazing how they've uh, given power to people to do studies like we're doing that, uh, that 10 years ago you just couldn't do. And uh, so that's how we, well actually it's 15 years ago now, that's when I started. So, so it, the, the technology driven uh, things got me involved with these dolphins and this is what they look like. These, these animals, uh, they have found fossils that are 25 million years old. They're, they're one of the two oldest species of toothed whales, or, or in the case of dolphins, Odontoceti is the technical name, uh, that exist. And, and uh, the sounds that they make, as you'll see here in a second, uh, just think about it, the uh, best I can determine is paleontologists and anthropologists believe that humans didn't really have used speech uh, earlier than 500,000 years ago. So these guys have been around a lot of time to develop their speech. This is the system I took down the first year. Uh, it fitted my shirt pocket. And, uh, but it was affordable. This was, this was a underwater microphone called a hydrophone that we took down, built by a, a guy over in Seattle. It was, it was affordable, but uh, kind of the most expensive thing that I had on that trip. <coughs> we chartered a boat, uh, looked on the internet, and found a guy that built this boat with a lot of battery capacity because his his uh, mission in life was to catch a thing called peacock bass, which are in the upper Amazon of Peru where we go. This boat was in Peru. And they're very spooky fish, and they're, but they're prized by anglers worldwide that come down to the Amazon to get their trophy. So Bill Grimes, the guy that built the boat or had the boat built, set it up to where it could run for three days without any rotating or noise-making equipment on board. And they could sneak into these areas, and of course it fit what I wanted to do, which is to record dolphins without a lot of interference from machinery noise. Uh, we took the boat up into a very pristine remote area of the upper Amazon on a river called the Ukiali River, and into uh, a preserve that even uh, indigenous people don't uh, live in because it's flooded year round, but it's full of dolphins. And that was the first year that we did that and came, have done it many years after, uh, annually afterwards. This was our laboratory where we uh, analyzed uh, the uh, noise of the dolphins. Uh, the gal on the right, Shirley Sherman, is a Bainbridge Islander my wife Dottie, myself, and the gal that w is the wife of the owner of the boat. And <coughs> the uh, way we were able to start analyzing this was with a free program on the internet called Audacity. Some of you may use that for other things, but Audacity allows you to, uh, after you record with the microphone these animals, you can start analyzing the, the details of their sound. And what I want to do is actually uh, show you, and I'm going to have to go out of this slideshow, but I've set up my audacity to play what I heard on one of, one of the, these, uh, these uh, recordings that we made up in the Pacaya Samaria wilderness area. And, uh, so, I did, at the time, I had no idea what we were recording, but when we got back and we started using Audacity, this is what I heard. 
In fact, this is what I heard on the headset as we were recording. Um, I'm, uh, so, this is a ta time is going horizontal and amplitude is going vertical. And this is just a voltage out of that hydrophone that we have that converts sound energy in the water to electrical energy that we can sense and record and put into a digital storage. So really, it's not very impressive. And I'm looking at these pretty large amplitude things, and I didn't, didn't really uh, understand what I was looking at. So what I'm going to do is stop this, and I'm going to put my, go, go ahead. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see, and we're going to, uh, oh, that was a catfish, that wasn't a dolphin. So I took one of these little hunks of higher amplitude stuff, and I can zoom in on that, that, that little chunk, and when I do that, I see this, and then I can actually play this back at a reduced speed. And when I do that, if I can find my, there it is, I'm just going to play this back. This is what that little bump was, and this is what it sounds like, slowed down by 90%. So that tells me, that told me two things. It told me, yeah, there's, there's something going on, even though I can't hear it, which means it's above the threshold for human hearing, which is about 10 kilohertz. And, and, and my recordings were just rich with this stuff. Well, as we were doing this particular recording, and this was the first place we saw this, um, we, we got into to a much louder amp amplitude sounds, and right here's a good example. And when I played that at regular speed, Dottie was keeping logs, and, and I said, well, this sounds like popcorn popping. So we dubbed it popcorn. So then what I decided to do is to, okay, let's slow this down and see what it sounds like. And when you do that, It sounds like a shotgun's going off. And what that, we were observing at the same time a group of three adult pink dolphins feeding in the, at the shore of the, the uh, little lake that we happen to be in off the Amazon. And we think that, we think that uh, what they're doing there is, is uh, either stunning or disorienting the fish so they're easier to catch and eat. And when I got back, I, I talked to a couple of professors that study, made their life history studying this stuff. And they, all, they basically, the, the guru of the world in that area was a fellow from the University of Hawaii by the name of Winthrop Al. And he told me, no, that's not possible. Well, within a couple of years, other people adopting this technology, they're saying, hey, we're seeing this with bottlenose dolphins, we're seeing it all over the place. And so he finally came around and did a paper on it. <laughs> and sure enough, we think that's what they do. So I'll get out of Audacity and go back to my PowerPoint slides and I decided uh, one of the things I did find out is that the clicks that you heard, the equipment that I had with Audacity and the the uh, range of sampling that I could do, the clicks were above that, extended above where I could actually analyze them. So I found a, a piece of software called Raven from the Cornell uh, uh, lab that uh, does a lot of bird sound work. 
and uh, acquired that and, and started really looking at this stuff in more detail. And over a couple of years, we were able to um, identify these clicks. And, and each one of these is like that click that you heard, but extended up, in this case, to about 250 kilohertz. It go even goes higher than that, but th for, for sake here, that's what we're looking at. You'll notice that there are red areas in the clicks. And we processed these, these clicks with uh, a team that had formed with us uh, that was pretty much globally uh, located. And a, a fellow from, from uh, the University of Toulon in France, a guy by the name of Professor Harry Gloton, had been working, he's a physicist, he was working on uh, what they called deep learning at the time, now it's AI. And he had access to the CERN computers, in, which is a big uh, physics laboratory in Swiss, I think it's in Italy and Switzerland that, that have enough power in the computers to process this way more than, than we could. But what happened was that um, well, let, me, let me back up a second. If you go to the internet and you go to Facebook, or you go to, uh, to uh, just type in an, uh, uh, Google looking for uh, the sound on metal plate. That's all you have to put in there. And you can hear the dynamical thing of this. But this is an example of what we think is happening with those clicks. If you make a one thousand cycle per second tone on a metal plate, that's the pattern you get. And you go to 3,000 cycles or 3 kilohertz, it changes. And it actually changes at 1.01 kilohertz, it changes. And so the hypothesis is that these animals use their clicks not just to find prey and be a, like a sonar, but they use it as a communications medium with huge bandwidth compared to humans. Our aural bandwidth is about, uh, about 10 kilohertz. These guys go to at least three or 400 kilohertz. So there, there's orders of magnitude more information potential in those clicks than there are in, in what we can hear. We use sight more than we, that we use hearing. Okay, I'll get back on track. Well, this led to our, the first published paper that we, uh, we did uh, on, on these clicks. And we presented that paper in, uh, in 2014 or 15. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jim Henderson. He can tell you what he's been up to. OK, well, my name's Jim Henderson. And uh, I have been involved in. Uh, oceanography and underwater acoustics for just a lot of years. Uh, I started, interestingly enough, out of college uh, as an Air Force pilot. And I flew for five years, and I traded the air for the ocean. Went back to graduate school, and I've just been having an absolute ball exploring on doing really interesting things in all the world's oceans. So OK, Dave? And so Dave was in the Amazon. Let's get a little closer to home. And this is an area called, outlined in red there, it's called the Salish Sea. And uh, Puget Sound is down in the bottom of that, and, okay. And Salish Sea has a, a number of different marine mammals that are endemic to this area. And across the top there you can see minke, uh, gray, and humpback whales. And also on there are orcas and Pacific white side dolphins and uh, harbor and dolls porpoises. And interestingly enough, each of these species makes noise that you can hear underwater. And those no each of those are, are different, OK? And so let's, uh, let's get a little closer to home. And Dave and I had the opportunity last summer to, uh, to go out and actually make some measurements. And we were on a vessel called the My Shannon. And Right over here are Joe and Shannon, who uh, had the vessel. And they were kind enough to, to take us around. And here you see those two up in the wheelhouse. And then on the right there 
Dave and I are just doing a little data analysis on some of the things that we had been recording. Okay? Now, now, I, I want to interject something. He's Air Force, I'm Navy. We, we don't always get along. And I'm sure that Jim He moves too slowly. <laughs> 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 okay, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, and so what we did off the vessel to my Shannon is, is we constructed what's called a hydrophone array. Okay, and, and this is those black things sticking out at each thing. There's five, two at the bottom on each side, two coming up, and then one there. Th those are the hydrophones, and we had them in a configuration as to where once we put those over, and there's cable going up to the surface to, to the laptop, and we could make recordings from there. And I'm in the process just of putting this over the side on an absolutely beautiful day. Okay, this. And this is, this is an example of some of the th things that you can hear within the Sally C, Puget Sound. And off the, the top here is uh, what Dave has shown in the past is what's called the time Whoa. series. Okay, and in this time series, the, the vertical axis is time and going across the bottom, or the vertical axis is level and going across the bottom is time. And then in the bottom one, we have what's called a spectrogram. Okay, and that's, we have frequency going up and time going across and what Dave was just playing right there, you can hear the, the whistles, the sounds. That's what it sounds like and that just, that happens to be a humpback wave. Okay. These carry for miles. Uh, the next one. Okay, this, this is again a time series across the top, yet this is an orca. And so go ahead, David. Hear that whistle? That's something you may have heard. That's the whistle of an orca, and then also embedded in there are clicks. The, the, the whistles are of a lower frequency. The clicks start about four to eight kilohertz and go much higher than that. So this is the kind of thing, if, if orcas were in the vicinity like they were just earlier this week around Bainbridge Island, you would expect if you had a hydrophone in the water to be hearing something like that. Okay, Dave? And one of the things we, we, we should point out is there are actually th about four or five animals in this short little segment of recording. And each of them have unique Social um, socialization calls, which is what you see on the the red area of the of the spectrogram, and and nowadays they're using AI to start identifying individuals around the world by these calls. And there's a lab up in Canada called Orca Lab, and they've done some of the groundwork on that. And we've worked we work with their data. And so you can not only spot these guys and look at their fin shape and their colors, but now from their acoustic sounds, they can identify that's J23, a female, 22 years old, she has four calves, that kind of stuff. <coughs> so the technology is really moving. Okay, and this is, a, this is an example of what it looked like in the, in, in the main salon of the boat in that this fellow here on the left, uh, that's Herbe Golton that, that Dave mentioned earlier. On the right there's some, some black boxes, if you will, with a bunch of wires coming in and out of them. And that's where those wires that came from the hydrophone up onto the deck and into that box. And Herbe's actually doing, he's, he's done some recordings and he's doing a little bit of analysis here. Now, we have worked with Herbe and, and what he does is he goes around the world and collects information, collects recordings from marine mammals. He sends them to us and he says, would you guys take a look at this? Tell me what you think's going on here or look at what's happening here. And so we go using some very sophisticated tools that we've put together and do analysis of the things that he's sending to us. And then Dave in the center there is, is, is fulfilling a really important role in that he is looking at something called, what is it, Orca Watch? Yeah. Orca Watch, which identifies where the orcas are in Puget Sound. And so he's saying, oh guys, we need to, we need to leave here and go over there. Maybe we can get to a point where we can stop and do, make some recordings. The guy in the background with the sunglasses, that's me. I'm making lunch. <laughs> okay. And then again, this is, this is a series of clicks. 
that we've been talking about from orchids. Okay, and you can see across the top, there's that time series that you're seeing again, and you see this big up and down, and then it gets quiet up and down, and we have seen clicks that the spacing between there has been like a half a second, or maybe a third of a second, all the way up to essentially thousandths of a second, depending on what the species is. So some of these things are clicking really fast. Okay, and then on the bottom there, is what we, have, we call the spectrogram. And you can see the, the different colors there. And those colors, as it goes up, that's higher in frequency, and the colors are actually the magnitude of the intensity uh, uh, of the call at that time, it's or, or the, the click at that time. And what you see is, is that the, those bright spots, those red rays change from click to click to click. And we have taken some very, very, a very careful look at that in a number of different species, and we're of the opinion that that could be communication. Not only is it clicks that are going out and identifying a salmon or something like that, I, gee, I, wa I wanna go eat that, but also because these cha things change so rapidly that that could be communication between animals, okay? Yeah, well, uh, I'd like, for those of you who are, may have some technical, that click lasts about 30 microseconds. It's not a very long click in terms of the actual energy from the animal. We, we sample, in this case, at 500,000 samples per second feed into our computer. And uh, the, each sample is a 24-bit word that allows us to to uh, create a file called a WAV file that uh, gives you these, these recordings. And so one of the challenges is we, we have to use a lot of memory. And think back 10, 15 years, a gigabyte, we didn't even know what a gigabyte was. It was so big. Well now, we're dealing in terabytes that we can afford. You can go to Costco and get a five terabyte traveling hard drive. And that's, that's 10 to the 12 bytes so we're able to, uh, you, you know, we're able to do these things that we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago. Go ahead, Jim. And, and we should point out that Dave has, has mentioned a, a software program called Audacity and something by Raven. We're using something called MATLAB and we're using a series of applications which were developed by a a rocket scientist. Truly. At, uh, truly, this guy's a rocket scientist at NASA. And we found that, and we took a look at it, and said, I wonder if we could use this and do some of the analysis that we want to do. And it's because of the tools that he developed to analyze rockets and all the things that they were doing with rockets, we have been able to come in and, and do some really sophisticated things and see things that nobody's ever really seen before. And this is just, just a quick example of something that, that we look at, and you can see the little, the little spikes along the left-hand axis there, and, and spikes. those are the vocalizations. And then as you move up, you can see these white things going across. Those are clicks. And then you can see white, and then some yellow going up, and those are higher amplitude clicks that are coming in. And then some more white and some more, and then some more vocalizations and such. And what we do is we zoom in on one of those clicks. And then we start to look at that, in, in a lot of detail, and we can determine some really interesting things, and we can watch those frequencies change between the clicks. And that was really our first clue to think that, gosh, there, there, there could really be some communications in here. Okay, Dave? And I will hand it back to David. Okay, Jim didn't want this slide because he said it's too busy, and the only reason I put it up here is this is the slide on the left, that goes up to about 10, 15 kilohertz in frequency. All of the world's governments use that particular slide, it's called the Wentz Curve, to set rules on shipborne activity around marine mammals. On the right, it's just a simple di uh, you know, comic book thing of we got ships making noise and animals making noise and they mix up. So I like that 
there's a term called acoustic gaze is be that's become adopted by people that worry about uh, marine mammals, as particularly or the sounds in the ocean. And marine mammals have this acoustic gaze. They don't, half their life is spent in dark, so they can't see like we can. But they've, they've evolved acoustical analogs to our visual ways of sensing our environment. And um, what I use here is <coughs> consider a big in city. Uh, you got 10 kilometers when it's a clear day, you can see. At five kilometers as the fog bank moves in and it gets thicker to two kilometers and pretty soon it's down to where you can't see your hood ornament. And uh, it's the kind of thing that we have been reporting on uh, as far as the impact of uh, anthropogenic noise, which is a fancy word for human noise, mostly for marine vessels uh, impacting these marine mammals. And so they're blind if there's a ship that's making too much noise or too close to them. And here's a, this one of the breakthroughs. We did a study for, for Hervey to give a talk to a bunch of politicians and admirals and people that are decision makers in the Mediterranean. And this particular encounter is with a cruise ship. And I'll let you listen to what they hear, the, the marine mammals hear. I hope I can let you listen to it. There we go. So he's uh, about three to five kilometers away there. Whoops, that's the middle one. What you're hearing there are diesels. Let me go back again. I'm gonna stop this. This is, this is when he came into Johnstone Straits. That, that buzzing noise is, is uh, part of the ship. And then when you get up here, when he gets close to these, you can see the, the, the uh, dolphins or the, the, the orcas around him. This is what you hear. Hear it drop off? The sound drops off substantially. The reason is the, uh, the uh, captain of the ship stopped the propulsors uh, so that the passengers could look at these orcas. And it, we, in analyzing this, this is from Orca Lab that we, we've worked with. The ship was doing nothing that was considered to be I illegal as far as approaching and being around marine mammals as the current rules exist. But the rules have, have, uh, are in the process and have been modified since then. Okay, so I'm done with that one. Whoops, what am I doing here, Jim? Okay, so that ship uh, is the Norwegian Jewel. It's a pretty typical cruise ship that goes up and down the inside passage to Alaska all summer. These ships are all over the world. And what we, what Jim and I saw was that the acoustic signature from this ship didn't look like any ship that I was used to. I was a submariner for a, a good part of my life and I thought I knew something about ship propulsions because we used to detect the bad guys that way. Um, but this was totally different. And even though he was following all the rules. The sounds that he was making were not like sounds that the rules were made to, to uh, determine how close people could get to orcas or any other marine mammal. And this is a, um, what, this is off of the MATLAB, and this really was, was sort of the thing that showed us what was going on. The oldest information is at the bottom and the newest information is at the top. It's a waterfall display is what we call it. So these lines are lines from these things. 
They're called azipods or asthma propulsors. Each one of those weighs 250 tons. There are two diesels attached to each of those in the ship that run at a constant 500 RPM. They're 12 they're 12 uh, cylinder large big diesels and they deliver d DC power to these pods that rotate 360 degrees at 15 degrees a second uh, uh, yeah a second and that's what pull pushes or pulls the ship through the the water they're very efficient they allow the ship's captain to go into ports without using tugboats but the real problem is the sounds that you saw there that were right and I'll go back to this you can see I've, we've labeled uh, the, the, it's when that's all running you're wiping out the clicks from the orcas and also you're wiping out the uh, vocalizations so they're basically blinded while that ships around so these these as the pods, are, they're DC motors, so they have magnets. They have a, a stator that's a series of magnets along the pod, and then they have a rotor inside that's also a magnet. And we believe that the noise that they're making is the magnetic field collapsing and expanding as the motor rotates. That's what makes it rotate. Um, and it does it at the frequencies, unfortunately, where marine mammals use their acoustic gaze to do whatever it is they want to do, communicate and or find prey and or navigate. So we reported that in, um, in a symposium in, in uh, France. And as a result of those findings and others, well, obviously we're not the only ones working on it, they've changed the rules. Uh, all of the big ferries in the Mediterranean and in the Atlantic use these same propulsors. Some of them are, uh, one propulsor can generate 24 megawatts of power. So it's a lot of energy going into the water. And they've actually changed the rules now as a result of this, realizing that these new technology ways of moving ships, uh, container ships, all of them use this. If they're built after two, 2005, um, we have to pay attention to it. Okay. Okay, again, closer to home here. Uh, <coughs> Orcas and Puget Sound, and I'm sure most of you saw the, the little show that went on the fir th th at the beginning where it showed the, the orcas in different areas a as they moved through last week. <coughs> okay, and there's the resident community. Uh, they typically mostly eat fish. As Dave said, they may have been changing their diet a little bit, but right now those orcas are considered endangered. Within, within Puget Sound. There's also what Dave mentioned is the transient orcas. And these, these are transient. They come from the northern part of Salish Sea. They may come from out in the ocean. They periodically go through Puget Sound and they like to eat seals. And they take care of any of the seal population. And it's interesting as they're moving through, they don't click a lot, nor do they make a lot of noise because they don't want to scare the seals away. So they'll come across these seals and snatch them. And you'll see seals up on buoys and probably on your dock. If you have a dock, if you see seals on your dock, it probably means these guys are close. So. <laughs> and like the, the transients that comes through, you know, the seals, smaller marine mammals, they also eat seabirds if there's a seabird sitting on the surface. Okay, Dave. Now, the state of Washington and uh, British Columbia, Canada have a developed a number of regulations, rules and regulations that they've put in place to protect these marine mammals. And essentially what this is saying is, is that, uh, that the U there's U.S. and Canada mixed there together. Canada's in meters, we're in, we're in yards or feet. And, and they're saying that a vessel speed of no higher than a, a half a mile of an orca, uh, seven knots. Okay, keep the speed down if you're close to them. And the distance from an orca is 300 yards from either side, 400 yards from behind, or 400 yards in the path of the orca. And they've set these up, and <coughs> one of the issues is it's, it's, it's been difficult to get this information out to the marine community. 
And there's just, they're just, they haven't really figured out how to do this. And unfortunately, what we have here is two orcas down in South Sound, four kids on a jet ski. Notice no life jackets on them. And they were trying to get up to those orcas to touch one of the, the, the either touch the orca or touch the, what, whatever it might be, okay? So obviously, they didn't get the word. Wh who really didn't get the word was their parents, i.e. life jackets and stay away from these animals. And, and, and this is- and We actually have videos of this, okay. but Shannon, my daughter, took the videos and she used some words that would be inappropriate. David. <laughs> So we have this, and this, this is not an isolated incident, and you'll probably notice that you'll hear from time to time one of a, a, a group that's down in Olympia continues to promulgate these regulations as they learn more about it, okay? Now, this is some things that, that you're not gonna see anyplace else or hear about. We have been a part of uh, Herve, which we talked about earlier, goes around the world and films and takes the recordings of underwater of these marine mammals, okay? And, and the first thing we're gonna look at is an orca herring ball. Orca herring ball, and the orcas are circling. There's one right there, and you can see it kind of coming around. It, it's hard to see. There's another one right there. They're circling this prey. And they're getting them into that school like that. We also know that humpback whales uh, will put out a bubble screen. And they'll do exactly the same thing circling in and then they'll go through and feed like the orcas will go in three, go, go through and feed, okay? It's something that nobody's ever seen before. Another orca doing this, okay? And uh, kind of get ready for this. There's a humpback whale that just went right through that school of fish. He didn't have to blow hey, hey, hey. Okay, look at that baleen, absolutely full of fish. We have, re not only we have, and you're gonna see a, here in a minute, the guys that were in, the, the guys in the water taking pictures of this stuff. Okay, and then again, here comes another orca up through and, and there's a calf right behind it. Okay, the, what's, uh, what, what's really interesting about this is that the acoustic recordings that were being made during that time, we think that we might be seeing communication between the orcas and the humpbacks. Nobody has ever seen anything like that before. And we, we, we think we got it. The, the, the Norwegian team is going up there again this year, late summer. And we're gonna get better recordings and hopefully at least as good videos so we can actually start to nail down if there is actually communication going on between those two species. Th that would be really something. Th yeah, th this was taken with a GoPro. It was underwater yep. proof. So the sound isn't anywhere near what we need to do the analysis. And unfortunately, we, they didn't have a time sync so we could match up what we're hearing, but we actually found low frequency clicks from these big boys and these humpbacks, so. Okay, and the next one we're gonna look at was taken up out of Orca Lab in Johnstone Strait. And this is an interaction between an orca and Pacific white side dolphins. So these, you can see these guys, they're cavorting around these whales, around the orcas, the Pacific white side. And everybody thought, oh yeah, that's, we've seen this before. They're using eyesight to assure that they don't run into them. In the recordings that, we, that were made up there at extremely high frequencies, we've discovered that those Pacific white sides are putting out clicks that start at 120 kilohertz okay, and are milliseconds apart. They're, they're differentiating something that's that big. 
and they're swimming around. So they're not only using eyesight, but they're also using acoustics to ensure that they don't run into that whale. And that's another thing that nobody had ever seen before and that we're in the process right now of working with the French group to, to write a paper on that. The, well, yeah, Jim is an Air Force pilot and, and I was, you flew with the Navy and uh, we all, we have thought, you know, you, you don't want to run two airplanes together. Th these guys are weighed as much as some of the airplanes you flew. And so how do they keep apart even though they're weaving in and out of each other? Well, we think this, this communication and, and uh, so basic sonar is how they do that. And, and it's, again, the technology <coughs> allows us to see things you couldn't see 10 years ago. Okay, so, so here's Bainbridge Island, the area around it. 63 and, miles. Yeah, okay, and as Doug said earlier, we did some projects here at the barn and uh, he asked, hey, what, can you guys think about doing something else? And Dave and I kicked a few ideas around and we are in the process right now of developing a prototype for an acoustic measurement acquisition system that people can build in a series of steps here in the barn and that system is going to be deployable off the side of your boat, toss it over or potentially a, uh, hook it up to a dock or even moor it out in front of your house. And what we're going to do is we're not going to have a cable running up to the beach or back to the boat. We're going to Wi-Fi this signal back. So if you're in your boat, you can be sitting in your cabin or wherever with your laptop and getting the information. You'll be able to hear it, but if you hear something really interesting, you push a button, you'll be recording it. And then you're going to come back and be able to take those recordings and look at some of this software and uh, do some analysis on it yourself. And we're, we're, we're working with some people in the barn right now. There's a possibility that we might put a server here or somewhere that would take all the information that these people are gathering, put it and make it available to everybody. Okay, are we done? Questions. Questions. So, any? Yes, sir. The, the, the one that I pictured was within the rules. He has to slow down below seven knots. If he detects or is, knows he's in water, it's frequented by marine mammals. Um, but again, as I pointed out, those rules were written based on those, those uh, decades old winds curves and don't, don't account for the, the azopod, the new propulsors and the kind of sound that they make. So at least in the med, they've started changing those rules to, to uh, not even allow ships in certain areas where there are marine mammals that, that uh, either are, you know, are, are gonna be sensitive to the the, the sound. And we, uh, the Canadians I know are far more aggressive in doing this than we are. Uh, so I, I don't know what it'll end up being. There's a lot of, it's polit there's a lot of politics. I mean, uh, you know, like the rules for staying 300 feet away from uh, orca. Well, if you're, you're in your motorboat fishing and an orca comes up to the boat, are you violating somebody's rule? Well, the, the common sense thing is just, Turn your motor off, uh, the, the, because the sound is what the offensive part of the engagement is. Yeah, essentially the question was, uh, do we have uh, information uh, uh, on the 
potential impacts of what the noise is doing to these animals, and the answer to that is yes, we do. Right here is one. We, we have seen that in a change in orca behavior as these cruise ships were going through up in Johnstone Strait, as a, for instance, the mothers quit nursing the calves <coughs> while, this while this was happening. And, and that, that's just one of the things that, that people have observed. So there, so there are impacts. Uh, and we've seen changes in behavior that they were kind of schooled together and then, and then they just kind of split apart. We're also, we also, when we were out the earlier in the summer last year, or late in the summer last year, we saw as the, 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 the pod was go headed north in South Puget Sound, we saw the, the, the males come over to one side where some vessels were, and we just happened to be sitting. We weren't moving, everything was shut down. We were just sitting there. They came over here and started leaping and, and doing all kinds of things. It was like to attract attention to the boats, yet over on the other side of the sound, the mother and a calf were going up the other side. So it's like they were trying to move people away and get them away from the, the pathway of the mother and the calf. Yes, Betty. The, well, oh, okay, Dave, Dave, hang on. Dave, let me, okay, what Betty's asked for, for the recording is that how are we going about capturing these, so what would be sociological, if you will, impacts on these animals? Okay, there's, in, in Puget Sound, in the Sally Sea, there are several uh, groups affiliated with the universities and NOAA, and they're actually able now to measure uh, a lot of behavioral changes uh, as a result of the increasing overall s soundscape from anthropogenic or human no sound in the water. Uh, another case is a blue whale uh, down in the Southern Ocean, down in, uh, around Antarctica. Um, we, one of the group that's, that we've uh, looked at or been with has measured that over the last decade, the, s the sounds that the blue whale make, which are very low frequency, almost infrasound, but travel clear across the Pacific because they're mates maybe two or 3,000 miles away, they've changed the frequency, they, they've actually changed the pitch of their, their, social, their song as a result of the impact of these propulsion systems that are that are becoming pr prevalent. So there's a global effort to do exactly what you're asking about. We're, we're, our holy grail is to get somebody that can measure in microseconds what we see acoustically with what they're visually spotting. <laughs> we haven't been able to do that. It's frustrating to us because we work in millin microseconds studying this, and most observers work in seconds or minutes. So. If we can get that all munched together, I think we'll see a lot more productive results. Yes. Yeah, the question was how does ferry noise compare to cruise ship? Well, it's it's less. Um, the newer the newer class ferries, uh, there's a there's a actually a group here on on Baymouth called Gloucester and Associates, and they have specialized for decades in in uh, quieting vessels. And uh, they, they have designed a system for the ferries that will be built, uh, not the class that's the, you know, the jumbo now. That'll be, that's, they're paying a lot of attention to marine mammals because they go right across where these things go. The, the, the ferry crews are well trained to slow down, stop, or avoid them by moving the tiller, you know, to get keep away from it. But but the, the the whale the whale watchers, I mean they make their living uh, studying the whales. But most of them are very responsible, and they'll be the first ones to report, you know, things like these kids on Skidoo uh, coming right up to the whales. But we you, you can go out any day around a pod of orcas and you'll see 
over 50% of anybody on the water with a motor on an, an engine on a boat violating these these uh, distance rules. It's just, it's not, our education system has not caught up with reality yet. So that's my answer. Yes. Yeah, the question had to do with uh, looking at communi possible communication patterns within these very short timing clicks and, and how are we evaluating that and what do we see. And, <coughs> and essentially what we're looking at at this level right now is we see a click and then we see another click that just might be a few microseconds away and then we see another, a series of that and, and we see the peak frequencies changing between each click, okay? And when we look at that, it looks a lot like, is there some kind of coding going on? Because it's going so fast, is there some kind of coding that we're doing? And we're working with the, with the French team right now with regards to a more sophisticated way to analyze this. David mentioned AI. They're starting to do that. The, the tools that we have now in MATLAB, we can see this but it's really hard to, to get in and say what exactly is going on. We need thousands and thousands of samples and then start to look at this and that's what that AI is gonna do for us. Really good, excellent, okay. You saw that hydrophone array? And that is designed to do just that, in that we've got two or three points, and, and, and we can say, okay, the, we, we first heard this particular click on hydrophone A, and then a little bit later we heard it on B, and then a little later we heard it on C, and just by doing the trigonometry of that, then you can determine the bearing to the animal. What we haven't been able to do yet is to figure out the, the loudness of the click, the distance of the way. We, we could do, s do some crossing and things, but we really haven't been able to come out with a really good way to figure out range. The, the, the uh, Professor Glott and Her Hervey uh, actually has done a lot of work with sperm whales over the years, and they have large heads. And they, he has figured out and written many papers on knowing where the whale is in three dimensions because the sound of the, there are two sound organs that make clicks. And these guys go down and, and chase giant squid. That's their main food. Well, click A bounces off the melon in one ge geometric pattern, click B another one. And he's able actually to track the path of these whales going down up to several thousand meters to catch the sperm, the, the, uh, the squid, yeah. Yeah, the question being, uh, can we distinguish sounds that, for instance, are used to, for echolocation, for let's say, cruising along the bottom or finding a fish or something like that versus those that are used possibly for communication? Uh, my answer to you is we don't have the foggiest idea, but there's no reason why they can't do both together at the same time. I mean, use the click for multiple purposes. The coding in the click could be the communication component and the, the click energy itself, and we do see echoes. I mean, we see echoes from their prey, we see echoes from the bottom and the surface and all kinds of places. Yeah, on the, the orca white side interaction, what we were seeing with those clicks was definitely an echo location. Those guys were clicking at an extremely high rate on a very, very narrow frequency, and so the, they could be picking up the edge of a fluke 
or the site of the animal or whatever. So that was an echolocation, but we don't know, and, and we really haven't looked and don't have the, at this point the capability to say, gee, is there an interclick between this specific white site over here and, and this one over here? And, and we haven't been able to do that yet. Centers. This is polystatic. Your aunt, I believe they do. Uh, what he's, if you got six animals putting energy into the water, can animal B interpret what animal A clicks are seeing? And I think that it's pretty common sense that they can do that. How the heck do these spinners of, a, of a hundreds of animals keep from banging into each other? <laughs> You know, I mean, I think it's a three-dimensional thing to them, just like our vision is. Uh, yeah, and yes, on, on the project, we're going to, we envision people will build their own system. They'll start by building a hydrophone with a cable on it, and, and we've essentially started that. They'll have some electronics in a box, and that'll go up, and w we're looking at, gee, why not? W we can have two hydrophones hanging on this, or we can have a system here and a system here that's, that's recording at the same time. Now, one of the issues you run into when you, when you have independent systems is trying to ensure that you can time sync those recordings. And that's, that's the Norwegians are driving us nuts. And those guys are out there swimming around in the humpbacks and the orcas and doing all this stuff and having this grand time and they're turning things on and off. I mean, they're just, they've ne nobody's ever seen this kind of thing, so, so we cut them a little slack. But we've certainly told them a number of times, guys, sync these recordings with these videos. So Even the Frenchman. Yeah, the Hervey's terrible about this. Yeah. He's a physicist, but he doesn't understand you got to measure in picoseconds. You know, so... Yes. Great idea, but streaming over Wi-Fi, that really broadband signal isn't going to work. We, 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 we just, you just can't. Well, we, the technology may be there in the next couple of years, though. I, well, I think I, you're right. I think it'll happen. We just can't do it affordably now. And Jim's, the reason I, Jim and I, I mean, we, we started to think, you know, it costs, Cost the same. You can buy a Tesla for the amount of money that universities pay for these arrays. Uh, we want to do it it's affordable for individuals, and we're starting to do that. I mean, the crystal, the little hydrophone, that the active part of that is how much money? We got two of them for twenty-one dollars. Okay. So, yes. and then you've got boards shrunk. You know these all kinds of little tiny circuit boards that used to fill up this room in this, with the same amount of capability. And, and, and the electronics, we're, we talked, you say electronics in a box, this is really an embedded system. And we're looking at a Raspberry Pi, you know, and, and, and if, if, God, if they ever start selling them again, we, uh, you know, for $41, we can get a Raspberry and put that in it with a couple of other things, and uh, we're ready to go. And we'll use solar power to keep a battery charge. Yeah. Just hang it on the... We're going for 24 bit. Okay, uh, Hervey right now, what, Hervey's doing 36? 32. 32, okay, but. But 24 is plenty. 24 we can do, and uh, we're that's gonna. That's a, that's a half. Uh, Wi-Fi. We're limited right now 
the data, wherever we can transfer, it's got to go over Wi-Fi. Our, our sample rate, w we hope, will be about between about 300 kilohertz. So we're ge generating a 24-bit word every uh, 300,000 300, times a second. So uh, there's a lot of data, and we'll put a buffer in this little box, which we could do now. But yeah. eventually, we'll have to pump it out using and Wi-Fi. And we would envision that the people that had this, they would be listening over Bluetooth on a headset or a speaker, and they might be out, and they, they got information that the orcas were coming, and oh God, here they are. And so they would push a button on this little GUI they had on their laptop, and it would start the system recording. And it might record for 30 seconds or something like that, stop, and then hit it again. And we could only jam so much storage into that, but, uh, and, and, and as time goes on, we'll be able to, right now, I, I think we might be thinking a terabyte or so in that box that we could store it to. Well, it, we're just scratching the surface. And if anything out of, if you, hear, what, hmm? yep. yep. Right. But, but, but last week we got recordings from the tenor, from Tenerife of pilot whales. It, it's a two minute recording that we got. It, and Herbie sends us this stuff from all over the world all the time. There's probably a hundred PhD theses in that two minute recording. It's, that's how little we know about this stuff that begs for somebody to do, <laughs> to drill down on, in, on parts of it. So it's an exciting world for us. I tell my doctors, I said, I, I don't want anything else, but I want you to guarantee I'm going to live 10 more years <laughs> after this visit. So, you know. Okay, so we will be sending out, everybody that signed up for this and came, we'll be sending out notice of the next meeting. And uh, if you're interested, hey, show up. If, if you're interested in building, certainly, or just show up and give us some more ideas. Dave, you have just, ju just go online, and uh, uh, if you if you open Facebook and search, uh, you know Orca, just say Orca North uh, Silent Sea. You'll see three or four of them. Orca Watch is all over the country. Actually, it's all over the world, but there are other groups that are specifically for the Silent Sea, and you'll see a list of them, and then they all have connect. You know that you can connect to them. Sir, yes. The question was, uh, would it be possible to take one of these recordings that's got a series of clicks in it and play that back? through a system to see if we could uh, talk, uh, see if other animals re would respond to it. He just volunteered, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, the, the French are doing some of this. And in Hervé, he's, he's, he's got all kinds of different things going on. And, and like, like Dave said, he's using some of the, the clicks from sperm whales, and he as they and they dive really deeply for these giant squid, and he's he's actually tracking them, and it's almost like a video game. And this comes down, and they're talking, and this animal goes down, and it, it, it's pinging out, and then they say, "Oh, there's a target," and you can see on the, the screen, here's the, here's the squid over here, and here comes the sperm whale like this, and then they're actually coming in it. The positioning of, 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 the, of the prey, the squid, is actually based on the return that they're getting on the acoustics. Okay, so, so they're doing that. He, has, he actually asked us to take a look at multiple sperm whale, sperm whales going after these squid and are, prove that they're communicating with each other as they're doing that. And we, we could correlate animal B at a different depth than animal A going after these squid and as this guy moved, this guy started moving with him. And so they've got the 3D vision with these, and, and 
they're, they're the strongest, the loudest things that are made in the ocean that aren't man-made are the clicks from sperm whales. And so, you know, they're, they're doing what you're saying, but we don't know how to figure out how to mimic that yet. So. No commercial opportunities here at all. I'm done. I'm retired. You were looking at two volunteers, retired volunteers. We don't, yeah, very, very retired. Three. Yeah, and again, we've had some of this, okay? We, we've got some of these tools, some of these things are available. We were able to get this program, MATLAB, at a really good price. We found this other stuff that NASA did. We got that for free. We took that and we applied what they were doing to what we wanted to do. So, so, so far, we, uh, we've spent a few dollars buying these little hydrophone crystals and these other things, and we'll build this prototype, and we'll probably have, I don't know, 100 bucks into it, each of us maybe, by the time we get this whole system as a prototype built. And then we'll say, okay, what's it going to take to glue all that together and the timing? And then we'll go back to Doug over here and say, okay, I, uh, I think we can, we can do this whole series of sub-projects for X number of dollars. And, and the barn's perfect. I mean... Yeah. If we need a machine shop, we got one. We'll, I know we're going to use 3D printers uh, for some of the stuff we're looking at doing. I mean, this is, I can't believe there's a better place in the United States than right where we're sitting today to do this kind of volunteer, you know, citizen scientist work. So. Where does the money come from? My pocket and Dave's pocket. <laughs> And, Actually, my wife and again, and <laughs> it, it's, we're, 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 we might have, by the end of the day, maybe $300 into this total as far as putting this, this prototype together. And, hey, you know, oh, oh, we don't count the, hour, the hours. We're retired, okay? The hours don't count. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. What do you think about sounds in water, but is there any directionality, uh, like a uh, tone around something to make it come this way or that way? Or? Me? You? Uh, well, the, the, all of the marine mammals have a, uh, what we call a polar distribution of where the sound beams are that come out of their melanin. And the, uh, most of those animals have been mapped in a lab. Now, we don't know that they were, behave the same way without humans in a swimming pool, but, uh, you know, they do have that. And our hydrophones actually aren't spherical. You can design one that's spherical, but the one that we want to use with these high frequencies probably is more of a toroid, toroid shape. And we're, we're, in the next couple of weeks, Jim and I are going to test that. To see what these little things look like. So, so essentially, what this is, there's omnidirectional sound in that it's coming from everywhere, okay, and then there's focused sound, and the clicks, for instance, are focused. There's a very narrow beam pattern that they're focused on, and, and we can see that as the animals go along, if they turn, the level coming into the hydrophone and sometimes the frequency will actually change because instead of the intensity coming right at the hydrophone, now it's 20 degrees off to the side, and we're picking up maybe a little side lobe off that main pulse. So I'm just mulling over everything that you guys are talking about. Very interesting. You know, the, the high frequency content of clicks is maybe not surprising, right? Because Fourier theory says that it has to have high frequency content to be a short burst. The, the, the question I would ask, though, is have anatomic studies been done of the species that have this uh, uh, presumed higher sensitivity and established that those sense organs, in fact, are sensitive to 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, whatever it might be? Has that kind of there, there, there is a gal in Woods Hole that has been doing a lot of that work. She's a she specializes in marine mammals, but she's a physiologist, and, and, and especially with the, their sound making and sensing. I mean, 
one of the first questions I had is how the hell does this animal process something that's on a microsecond basis? And it, you know, if you, it's parallel processing. I mean, that's that's what the hypothesis now is, is that, you know, their brain size is bigger than ours in many cases, and they don't just process that click in one part of their brain or a series of clicks. It's parallel processed with many neurons or whatever. So the resonating at those frequencies. Forget yeah. the, the neural process. That's a good question. I mean, I got a question about do their teeth, are their teeth some sort of a mechanical modulator? I, if you want to do a PhD on it, you should, because nobody's done that. <laughs> Orcas are about 50 to 75 microseconds. Smaller marine mammals, the ones I study in the Amazon, no more than 30 microseconds per pulse. So uh, they all vary. Uh, mapping the patterns of the clicks in terms of spatiality and sort of like the silence between clicks, like do they all fall into any kind of pattern language? Or are we just looking at like sequential no, we haven't really looked well, at that. Pe people have looked. I mean, well, people are look interclick interval. We call it. And is there a pattern within the interclick intervals? And a lot of the people have looked at that. Uh, I don't know that anybody's come up with any. I, what I see is it goes from very clear patterns to to anarchy. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't think there's a real answer yet. I, I really, it, the question had, had to do with what, what, what can we do now with the AI software? And uh, I think it, it's so new now that what we're that people are trying to do that I don't think we really understand its capabilities. I think it, as, as people get smarter about this and start looking at some of these different data sets, I, I, I think that it's going to open up a whole new world. You know, we're, we're really limited in the analysis. We're essentially doing the kind of analysis they've been doing for 15 years. Uh, fast Fourier transforms, that kind of stuff, looking at this stuff. It, it's just, we've come up with different ways to use these tools to see different things within this. Uh, but AI is the next big step. For, for anybody that sent, knows this stuff, we're actually looking at other transforms that may be more appropriate for these kind of phenomena. The, the, one, the paper that I showed, we actually did a Fourier, but we also did a what they call a Gabor transform. And, and uh, they matched up pretty well, but the Gabor had slightly different emphasis on things that we didn't see in the Fourier transform. And all these transforms are just humans fiddling around with mathematics. And you know, you, who's the guy that wrote the code for that Fourier transform? You find out that guy A doesn't write the same code as guy B does for the same Fourier transform. So. <laughs> It goes on and on and on. And again, hey, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, and especially you. those good questions.